So excited about beginning this new series today. What I know is, is that God is passionate about us and God doesn't want to leave us hanging. God wants to give us instruction that we need so that we can really make right and good decisions in our life. The name of this series is called The Wise Guy and I Ain't It. It's not self-promotion time. We're going to be learning from a really wise guy as we go through this series of messages. You may have heard a statement like this before. Confucius say, Gandhi say. Well, what I want to tell you is what Solomon say. How's that? Solomon is the wisest guy in the Bible. And what we're going to be doing is looking at the Proverbs that he wrote uh, in the Scripture so that we can gain real good understanding about many of the different elements of our life. So this message really is about gaining wisdom that can affect our life to help us be more successful as we live. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about Solomon. Solomon was the son of David and Bathsheba. David was the king of Israel, and when he died, Solomon became the king. And Solomon was just a kid. God came to Solomon, and he asked him, what do you want? And we hear what he said. So I want you all right now to stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. And I want to tell you this part of the story before we get into the Proverbs so that you know what's going on. This is found in 1 Kings chapter 3. This is what the Bible says. At Gideon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Well, let me give you a little, in, little uh, information about what happened next. Well, Solomon says to him, hey, you're really cool. This is Tim paraphrase, obviously. You're really cool to my dad. Very kind to my dad. It's really awesome. But now I'm here as the king and I'm just a kid and I have no idea what to do. So this is what he asked. In verse 9, So give your servant a distinguishing heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So he asked, these, asked for these things. And God said, hey, this is really cool. And the reason why he said this is cool is because, Solomon, you didn't ask for a long life. You didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for me to send lightning bolts and kill the people who are your enemies. Don't you wish God would do that occasionally? That'd be really cool. But that's not what Solomon asked for. Instead, he asked for this discerning spirit, this knowledge. So what we see next is in verse 12, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Thank you very much, and you can be seated. I tell you, there's no one better to learn from than the wisest of all, right? Confucius, not wisest of all. Gandhi, not wise as a fall. But this king had great wisdom about how it is to live. And he gave great instruction. We will listen to words of wisdom when we know we need it. Now, I see before me two types of people today, the wise and the fools. Any fools out there? You want to admit that? Hey, thank you so much. We become foolish sometimes. Three of you were honest today. How's that? Um, many times we do become foolish in the decisions that we make, but God wants us to be very, very wise. So I want to share with you already from the Proverbs. Again, that's where we're going to be learning this information. No better place to start here than Proverbs chapter 1. So I'm going to ask you to follow along now as we read this passage. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and, and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for, for giving prudence to the simple. That is really a great statement because if you're simple-minded, there is hope, praise God, right? For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables. The sayings and riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Well, I want to share with you several things today about the importance of wisdom and how it can affect us. Now, as you look at your outline, you see there's a lot of information, and as time goes by, you would probably fret if I didn't do what I'm about to do. You see, Tim has done what he does many times, put more information that he can handle. So what I want you to do right now, on the top of your sheet, is I want you to guess. There are five points. I want you to guess which one of these points I am not going to do. Now, this sounds silly, I know, but we're going to have fun today. I want you to do it right now, and I'm going to look to see if everybody's participating. If nothing else, just put your head down to make me think you're doing this, all right? Write a number on the top, from one to five. Which one do you think we're not going to cover? All right, now we've done that. How many of you think we're not going to cover number one? Raise your hand. Big mistake. Number one on your outline sheet says this. Wisdom is a foundation of life. I've been watching way too much American Idol. Can you tell? We're going to vote something off here tonight. That's what we're going to do. Wisdom is the foundation of life. We need to gain wisdom. 
I say it's the foundation of life because there are many parts of our life and we need to master certain things and it requires our learning. We need to learn, first of all, to live the regulated life. So on your outline sheet, you see that bullet, the regulated life. Now, out next to that, I want you to write the word discipline because that's actually the word that is used in the Scripture. But if you look at a definition of discipline, it means to be able to regulate your life or to control your life. What that means is, is I need to be able to control my life and not be out of control. Some people are just flat out out of control. We gain knowledge so we're not out of control. There's a second part of our life. We need to learn to live the managed life. So put that on your sheet. There's another bullet. The managed life. And out next to that, I want you to put the word prudent. Write the word prudent because that's what the Scripture says. And if you look at the definition of prudent, we see that, it, that it's a life that we're able to manage in a good way. Now what this deals with are the affairs of our life. There are many different affairs of your life. There's our family life. We are to manage our family life. There's our work life. We are to manage that well. There is our financial life. We are to manage that well. In fact, as we go through this series, we're going to hear what Solomon has to say about those issues and many others. So what we need to do is to be able to manage those things well. And if we don't manage those things well, we go bankrupt. So I want you to write that phrase down somewhere on your sheet. We go bankrupt. Now, when we hear that statement, most of the time we think about it related to our finances. But I want you to think about it in this way. When we go bankrupt, we lose it all. You see, if we don't gain wisdom and manage our family life well, we can lose it all. If we don't gain wisdom and gain information about our work life, we can lose it all. If we don't gain wisdom and manage our financial life, we can lose it all. You see, what God wants us to do is to gain learning, to increase our learning so that we may not lose it all. You see, some people are foolish because they don't, they don't learn things that can help them stop the bankruptcy problem. It may be, though, that some people have a very successful family life and a very successful work life and a very successful financial life. But the problem is they haven't managed another part of their life well, and it's called their spiritual life. Some of you are familiar with Tom Brady, who's the quarterback of the New England, England Patriots. Hey, if you're not a sports fan, maybe you're a fashion fan, his girlfriend is Giselle. And from what I understand, she's hot. I wouldn't know anything about that at all, but anyway... Really doesn't add much to the story. Let me go back to Tom Brady. Tom Brady is a, a great quarterback. In 2007 and 2008, during that season, he won the MVP award because he threw more touchdown passes that year than any other quarterback over the history of the NFL. We also know that he has won three Super Bowl rings. Big-time accomplishment. In 2005, after he had already run, won some of these uh, rings, he was interviewed by someone on 60 Minutes named Steve Croft. So Brady began to open up about his life, and I want you to hear what he had to say. He said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what it's all about. I reached my goal, my dream, my life, me. I think it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be all it's cracked up to be. So Steve Croft heard him say this, and he began to press him about this. Well, what do you think the answer is? And Brady answered this way. What's the answer? I wish I knew. I love playing football, and I love being quarterback for this team. But at the same time, I think there are a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. That's some powerful stuff, isn't it? So often we get our family life together or our girlfriend life together. We get our work life together. We get our financial life together and still there's a problem because we haven't managed our spiritual life better. Let me tell you something. The most important thing during the dash is your spiritual life. There's something else we need to manage. We need to learn to live the proper life. Put that on your sheet. The proper life, and the proper life deals with the right life. So put the word right out next to that. Why do we do that? Because that's what the Scripture talks about. You may remember over in 1 Kings chapter 3 when Solomon was talking about his condition, he was asking God to give him a discernment so that he could discern between what is right and what is wrong. We need to move toward what is right and to move away from what is wrong. Our ability to be successful in life is really centered around, many times, our ability to determine what is right and what is wrong. So what is all of that about? You see, we need to learn another part of life. Write this down. It's called the moral life. We need to learn about morality. 
We need to gain wisdom about our morality. Now, we have a leg up about our moral life, and the reason is is because God created us, He wired us to know the difference between right and wrong so that we can live the moral life. Even science today is proving this fact. At Yale University, their infant cognition center, they did research and they did it on babies as young as from age 6 to 10 months old. And when they did this research, they determined that these young babies were able to to determine again, to be able to figure out what was right and what was wrong. And this is how they did it. They did a little exercise. They had this play set that looked like a roller coaster. And they had this little, little wooden figure that looked like a cartoon. And they had this little figure trying to go over the top of one of the humps of the roller coaster set. Well, they had these other toys as well, and some of those toys were there to help that figure go across the hump, and some of those toys were there to keep that toy from going across the hump, like a bully would do. So here are these people, these researchers in front of the little babies, and they're playing with the little cartoon figure going up the hump, and they'd grab these toys that would help them go over the hump, and they would help them go over the hump, and then they'd grab the other toys, and they would push that little toy back down where it couldn't go over the hump. After a few minutes, they stepped away and just let the little babies play. And it's amazing what happened because not one baby played with the bully toy. Not one played with one of the toys that tried to keep it from going over the hump. Why? Because they were determining what was right and what was wrong. It's right to help. It's wrong to hurt. Y'all, is that good stuff right there or what? You are wired. Even six-month and ten-year-olds do better than us sometimes, don't they? We know that we have been wired in this way, and we need to live a moral life. Look on your outline sheet, there's another. We need to learn to live the honest life. What that means is the fair life. So I want you to write this word out next to it, write the word fair. That's what the scripture says, and when you look that word up, the word fairness means to be honest. And this is how it works. Maybe it will help you get this a little bit better. To be fair, to make a fair decision about something, there are three things that we have to be honest about. The first thing is, is I have to be able to take an honest look at myself. I have to do a self-assessment and really honestly see who I am. In my goodness and my badness, see who I am. Then I need to look at the person who's involved in this decision, the other person. And I need to take an honest look at who they are. Their goodness and badness. I understand those things, but to honestly look at them. And then I need to take a third thing, an honest look at the situation. To see really what's going on. Sometimes we don't see those things for what they really are. Now when I take an honest look at myself, and I take an honest look at the other person, and I take an honest look at the situation, then I can make an impartial decision about the person that I'm making a decision about. But if I don't do that, I may have in my mind, because I haven't looked at this person the right way, because they've done things against me, they've hurt me in some way, instead of being impartial toward them, I am very partial because I want them to pay. And I am not fair in my decision. You following it? So what I want you to do right now is to write a formula down, because I know how you like to write formulas. You love it, I know you do, so here it is. I want you to put the word me Put the word me on the right-hand side of that. Put a plus sign. Put the word others. So it's me plus others on the right-hand side. Put a plus sign. Put the word situation. After the word situation, put a little equal sign and put the word fairness. i got to take an honest look at me, honest look at others, honest look at situations, and then I can be fair. Do you know what that requires for me to do these three things? Gaining wisdom. I am learning things about myself and others and what's going on around me. You cannot be wise and make good decisions unless you see what's going on in you, what's going on in others, and what's going on around you. Y'all, that's good stuff whether you know it or not. It's deep, but it's good. Look on your sheet. There's another type of life. We need to learn to live the observant life. And out next to that, I want you to write this word. Write the word discerning. That's that's the word that it uses in the Scripture. When I observe, what I do is I see how other people live their life. Have you ever heard somebody make the statement, learn from my mistakes? I think all of us probably heard something like that. Learn from my mistakes. What they're saying is, hey, don't do something dumb like I did. Just learn from me. Well, here's something else that we can do. Is learn from other successes. If people only can say, learn from my mistakes... Dude's got a pretty bad life, don't you think? I mean, is really is your whole life a mistake? Surely there's some successes there. 
And what we want to do is to gain wisdom. Oh, this is sweet too. So that there are some successes. I am able to discern what is a good decision right now because I observe the good things that other people have done and the stupid things that other people have done. And by doing that, I can discern now what is right and what is wrong. Okay, that was number one. The most important thing right now for us to do, though, is to determine whether number two made the cut. All right? How many of you out there wrote number two on your sheet? Y'all are afraid. Y'all are, I'm telling you the truth. One person raised their hand back there in the back. No two. I see two now. Well, I'm sorry. Y'all are big losers, too. We're going to move on. Number two, that's probably why you're not going to raise your hand anymore, right? I'm calling you names. Number two, wisdom is to begin during our youth. To begin during our youth. In other words, what, what we're supposed to do is to start learning at a young age. Think about Solomon. He was just a kid. He knew he needed wisdom, so he started at a young age. What this means is, is that Solomon was not a know-it-all. That's great. Can't stand know-it-all kids. I know you can't either. Also, what I know is many know-it-all kids grow up to be know-it-all adults, don't they? We need to not be know-it-alls. And really, at a young age, we need to start wanting it and hungering for it. Someone else at Yale University is a professor. His name is Anthony Cronman. He's a lawyer there and teaches those, teach those classes, uh, helping people go into the law profession. And what he said was, is when students come in today as college students, they're going to discover that there is a big omission in the educational program that no one tells them or teaches them how to discover the meaning of life. What they'll teach them is about math. They'll teach them about science. They'll take, teach them about English. They'll teach them about many other things. But he said they never, they don't do this. They don't teach them about the meaning of life. And he said this, that students today have a hunger to determine spiritually what this life is all about. That's what we should hunger for. And we should spend time to help these students gain wisdom. It's so critical for us. Why do we gain wisdom? Look on your sheet. Write this statement, we gain wisdom for understanding. For understanding what? So I want you to write a phrase next to that. Write the meaning of life. I gain wisdom so I can determine what the dash is all about. <laughs> well, what is this all about? Well, how do I learn that? Now, here's the thing that this uh, professor was saying. He was saying, we don't have any education to do it. In other words, you don't go to a class and we don't have any educational processes or tools that we use to teach you the meaning of life. But this is, this, is, this is really awesome. The Bible says that there are some things, some teaching techniques that teach us the meaning of life. It even listed. That's why we're doing this message series. The first one is something called Proverbs. Write that down on your sheet. Proverbs. Isn't this book called Proverbs? It is. So we learn the meaning of life by looking at the Proverbs. A proverb is a popular saying that is used to teach a very important principle. And we'll be looking at many of those. But we hear Proverbs even in secular society. Not too long ago, about two months ago, I was at Upward Basketball. And during the halftime there, Laura Teresi, who was over the Upward Basketball program, who did a phenomenal job, by the way, was given the devotion. And she shared this with the crowd. It's by Oliver Wendell Holmes. It should be on your sheet, or on the screen, excuse me. This is what he said, Greatness is not in where we stand, but in what direction we're moving. We must sail sometimes with the wind and sometimes against it, but sail we must and not drift, nor lie at anchor. When I heard her say that, it blew my socks off. I mean, I just heard her that. It's like, man, this is awesome. Because it taught me a spiritual principle. This secular saying said something to me, and it reminded me of this, I cannot change the world standing still. Can't do it. And there are going to be times in my life that there are pressures in my life that are, going to, that are going to try to help, that are going to try to cause me to stay at anchor. Stay right there not doing anything. And, and sometimes it's going to be easy where I'm going to move and I'm going to go with the wind. And other times it's going to be difficult and I'm going to go against the wind. Did you, I don't know if you know this or not. I'm a sailor, but let me give you a, a, something about sailing if you've never sailed before. Sometimes we can go the farthest distance when the wind is coming against us because it takes wind for the sailboat to move. Oh, that's good right there too, right? The wind comes and we move. The harder the wind comes, the faster we move or sometimes we tip over. 
But those things are good for us because they help us make a difference in the world. Well, there's something else that is used, not only Proverbs, but parables. You already see that written on your sheet. A parable is a story that teaches us a principle. Jesus, his main way of teaching us was through parables. The word parable means comparison. So as we, what we do is we hear the story and we compare it to our life. And this is exactly what Jesus did. I'll give you an example. If you want to read some parables, go to Luke chapter 10. One of them is this parable. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. You may have heard it before. There was a guy who was injured on the side of the road. There were three people who came by. Two of them just passed right by. But one of them stopped and helped this person who was hurt. Jesus, after he told the parable, asked a question. And the question was this. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor? It's a no-brainer, right? I mean, the one who helped the person. And what Jesus was doing was, in asking the question was to get the people to compare their life to his life and to say, am I just passing by people in need or am I stopping and helping? I want, you to, I want you to really grasp something about the Word of God. This book doesn't mean squat, good spiritual term. It doesn't mean squat unless you apply it to your life. That's why I'm not all about you coming in here and getting a bunch of facts from this book. What I want you to know is what it means to you and how it can radically change you. To look at your life and say, which of these people am I? What am I supposed to do with my life? And we do this through the parables. I want you to do it when you read the scripture. There's a third way in which we learn. It's through sayings. Write that on your sheet. Sayings. It's a, a saying is a statement that communicates an observation to us. There are many sayings out there. Some of them are secular sayings. Again, here's one. It's on the screen. Life isn't only about the destination. It's also about the journey. I'm saying it again. Life isn't only about the destination. It's also about the journey. So often what we do is we want to get to where we're going and we don't enjoy the ride to get there. We don't see what's going on for us to get there. Again, I'm a boater, so I want to give you an example of this. Because again, I see two different types of people in front of me. I see speedboats and I see trawlers. How's that? A speedboat is someone who just goes and gets there as fast as they can and everything zips by and they don't see it at all. But a trawler is the one who gets there and notices what's going on because it takes a while to get there. We need, to, we need to be people who are observing what God is doing in our life to get us to a destination. God is always attempting to get us to a destination. And we need to see that that's what He's up to around us. And when we notice that, even though it's difficult, we can see it's a beautiful thing. It's a great and beautiful thing. How many baseball fans do we have out there today? Any baseball fans? Hey, several of you. More than I think the other crowds. Well, I want to give you another saying. It's a wonderful saying. In fact, I learned this saying, listen to one of those, you know I'm a pastor, I listen to a lot of spiritual radio called sports talk radio, that's basically what I listen to. I know I should be listening to Christian stations and all that, give me a news network or sports talk and I'm a happy camper, all right? When I was riding uh, this past week, somebody was on there talking about baseball, and I don't know if you know much about baseball, there are nine batters that play baseball. The ninth batter typically is the worst hitter of them all. Now, if you're a professional ball player, you better be able to hit. But normally, they're the worst hitter of all. And they're considered to be in the ninth hole. That's what they call that ninth position. So here's a statement that I heard. It was really good. I think it's going to be on the screen, too, because it does have great spiritual meaning. Here it is. Walking the man in the ninth hole is like checking how much gas you have in your tank with a match. In other words, if you are dumb enough to walk the person in the ninth hole, you are a dumb person because he's the easiest one to get out. And there he is on base, and it can cause you problems. That, that's the problem with us. Many times we allow things to slip by us, and we don't observe things that we need to do, and it causes our failure. Isn't that sweet? This week you're probably going to hear some sayings. I want you to think, man, Tim talked about this this weekend. I need to hear this and learn some knowledge from this. That is, if it's right, if it's wrong, just think that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard and just move right on, okay? But there are other things that can teach you, and the Scripture helps us see this. There's something else that, that is used. It's called riddles. When I think about this, I think about Batman and the Riddler. You, know, you think about that, the big question mark, the Riddler? Hey, I think the new Batman movie, isn't that, I think that's the villain. Oh, it's, God passed away not too long. That's a whole other story. I'm not going to get into that. But... When we think about riddles, there are statements that we're trying to figure out. 
Well, that's not the only type of riddle there is. See, riddles can deal with something, but riddles can also deal with someone. I can make this type of statement about my wife. She's a riddle to me. In other words, I just cannot figure her out. Maybe there's some things that they that might be true in. This is a very spiritual thing because this is something that someone may be able to say about God. God is a riddle to me. I just can't figure him out. And the reason why many can't figure him out is they isolate one event that they connect with God and they try to, to determine who God is from that isolated event when there are a lot of other things that go into figuring out the riddle. God is always up to something good. You know what I just gave you? A saying. God is always up to something good. He is never up to something bad. You ought to remember that this week. When you look at things that are happening, God is always up to something good. He is never up to anything bad. So therefore, I shouldn't see this as a riddle. I should see this as a good answer that's coming my way. So he uses all these things. There are proverbs. There are parables. There are sayings. There are riddles. Why are they all there? to help us in our decisions. There's another statement. There's another bullet. It says we gain wisdom so we can practice discretion. What does that mean? I, I want you to write this phrase next to it, these two words. Responsible decisions. God teaches us to do all these things so we can make responsible decisions. We hear that phrase all the time. They're irresponsible. They're so irresponsible. Why are they irresponsible? Because they haven't taken time to learn how to be responsible. So it takes our energy to do that. Well, the most important thing for us to do right now is to figure out whether number three has made the cut. How many of you wrote number three down on your sheet? Thank you so much. Maybe you are being honest about this. You can put your hand down. Once again, you're idiots. Number three on your sheet says this. Wisdom, wisdom's focus is on addition. Please forgive me for calling you names, okay? Wisdom's focus is on addition. We are to add things to our life. We only gain wisdom when we add things. And many of us need to add things to wisdom to compensate for the things that we forget. What I'm noticing is the, the longer I live, the more I forget, and the easier it is for me to forget. It is just very frustrating to me. I, I mean, I, my thing right now is I keep forgetting where I put stuff. We just moved uh, to another house. Actually, we moved back to a house that we lived in before. We just this past week have been moving to another house. So we've been putting stuff places all week. And I, this is what I've been doing. I've been thinking deliberately about where I put stuff so that I won't forget where I put it. And what has happened to me is I've, getting, I've gotten to the house and I cannot remember where I deliberately put stuff. I am a... I just... This really has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. So let's, let's go on. Our adding wisdom leads to growth. We want to grow. So let me give you a little way in which you can gain wisdom. It's called new experiences. We don't gain wisdom without new experiences. It might be that we're around a new situation or whatever we learn from that. We observe what's going on around us. But it might be that it's this new experience, that you get a book and you read it. It's not a promo for my book. It is just saying we ought to, we ought to get a book. I, this is a homework assignment that, again, I say this all the time, it will not be checked, but I would encourage you to get a book. There might be some, something that you're struggling with in your life. Why don't you get a book, a good spiritual, good theological book, related to it, a solid book, and learn something about it because that is a new experience that's going to help you gain knowledge. It might be some of you need to get in a small group, something like that. To get, it's a new experience to help you gain knowledge. Look at the other statement. Our adding wisdom gives us a better filter. We filter all the decisions that we make through our knowledge. We can only make decisions through what we know. So the more we know, the better able we're to make good decisions. If you don't know any more than you did a year from a year, a year ago, then you're not going to make any different types of, of decisions. But if you've gained knowledge and experience, things can change radically for you. Well, the most important thing for us to do right now is to figure out whether number four has made the cut. Now, now what you have determined is we've gotten to the final. Again, it's American Idol time, right? Final night, there are only two left standing. So it's either number four or number five. How many of you put number four on your sheet? You are absolutely correct. Hey, isn't that great? Um, I wish I had a gift to give you. Um, but actually, I have some Tic Tacs in the back. If you want a Tic Tac, I can give you a Tic Tac. I don't know if that, some of you might need that. All right, let's move to number five. 
We skip number four. We're going to number five. The wise avoid the foolish life. Now, I mentioned this at the very beginning. Before us today are either wise people or foolish people. And the way we know that is because the Bible tells us that very thing. In verse seven, it tells us, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So it actually uses the word fool. So number five is the wise avoid the foolish life. So I want to describe to you some fools. And we're going to be able to figure out whether we're a fool or not. The first fool is this. It says the fool or fools don't believe in God. Write that down. The scripture teaches us this in Psalm. You see in other passages of scripture throughout the Bible we learn these principles. The fool says in his heart there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. These are the people many times who manage their life well or manage their family well, manage their work well, manage their finances well, but spiritually they haven't managed themselves well and here's the reason why, because they have made themselves their own God to manage all those other things. And what we should know is this, that people who don't believe in God typically don't act like God. People who don't believe in God, now this isn't always the case, I realize that there are some people who can be fairly moral people who don't believe in God. But many times people who don't believe in God are very self-centered people who have made themselves their own God. We're a fool if we do that. Now look at the second description of a fool. Fools can't stand learning and correction. If you don't like, if you can't deal with learning and correction, you're a fool. Scripture says this, again in Proverbs 1, 7, but fools despise, circle the word despise, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. What that means is someone makes a mistake, someone comes to them and tries to correct them, and they don't receive it well. Instead of receiving it well, what they do is they begin criticizing the one who tried to correct them. And they try to make the one who's trying to correct them be wrong and them right. If you are a supervisor of people, if you're in a business world or even in anything else, if you're a supervisor of people and have had to supervise multiple people that, that would think this has probably been the case for you, there's probably been at least one time in your life where you tried to correct somebody and they didn't receive it well and they came against you. I'm a pastor and I supervise people and it's happened to me more than once and I ain't telling no stories about that. You don't need to hear anything like that. But it's really sad to me when even Christian people or so-called spiritual people can't Take correction. They can't hear it and grow. And this is what I know about employees. Employees who can't take correction never become better employees. Hey, that's a really good saying right there, isn't it? I'm just full of them today, right? Employees who can't take correction never become better employees. People who can't take correction never become better people either. That's why we need to be people who take correction. If you can't take correction, you're a fool. Look on, oh, this is fun. I can call people fool and feel good about it. Look on your sheet. Fools don't take advantage of what is offered to them. If you don't do this, you're a fool. I'll give you an example of it. Let's imagine there's somebody who's struggling in their married life, and you know that. So you go down to the bookstore, the Christian bookstore, and you buy a great, wonderful book that can help them grow and help them make better decisions in their married life. So you go and you give this to the husband. You give it to the husband, and the husband thanks you. And the husband never opens the book. He never turns the cover even to figure out who the book's dedicated to. I mean, he never opens the book. You're a fool. You're an absolute fool. Somebody just gave you something that can radically change your marriage and you won't even open the book? Come on! You're a fool. Some people may have been given things or around things that are available to you that can help you. I'll tell you this. Some of you are struggling with addictions or, or habits or something, and there are things out there who, that can help you out, and you know about them, and you're not participating in them. Some of you have been thinking about going to celebrate recovery forever because you know you need it, but you don't go. You're a fool. If you know it can help you and you don't go, you're a fool. And God wants you to be wise. Y'all, this is strong stuff. Look at the next statement. Fools prove their foolishness by what they say. Oh, this is a sweet one right here now. You want to find a fool? Just listen to people for a while, right? Scripture says this. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. What that means is the mouth of a fool causes division. It doesn't cause there to be unity. So you can hear people say, are they causing friction between people? They're a fool. We can also tell, this is a great CSI thing, all right? 
a thing that you can notice and see about people, observe about people, who gives people way to help you see that they're a fool. I want to, I want to help you see what it is. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 32. If you have played the fool and exalted yourself, or if you have planned evil, clap your hand over your mouth. So let's all practice it right now. Let's clap our hand over our mouth. Do it one more time. Okay, this is really sweet. Okay, this is really great. If you ever see somebody clap their hand over their mouth, they're a fool. Isn't that, isn't that sweet? You're saying, Tim, I mean, that, that is a huge generalization. I mean, is that really true, that they're a fool? Well, they might not be a long-term fool, but they were a short-term fool. Because whatever they just said, they know I shouldn't have said. It was foolish. I got a feeling some of you will never clap your hand over your mouth again. You may never do it again. Well, the other thing about it, there's another scripture. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Words from a wise man's mouth are gracious, but a fool is consumed by his own lips. At the beginning his words are folly. At the end they are wicked madness. And the fool multiplies words. Let me give you a Tim paraphrase. They talk too much. They, they clap their hand over the mouth, gives them away. They talk too much, they're a fool. If you talk too much, you're a fool. The reason is, when you're talking... You're not listening, and you don't learn without listening. So some of you need to keep your mouth shut for a while. At least I didn't say shut up, right? That would have been bad. Some of you need to keep your mouth shut for a while to see what God wants you to learn. Look at the next one. Fools aren't socially aware. What that means is they don't see how their behavior is affecting other people. <laughs> they don't get how what they're doing is affecting other people in a negative way. Let's move on. Let's get to the next one. Fools are unsuccessful. The scripture says this, the fool folds his hands and ruins himself. Okay, we're doing some more sign language right now. Let's fold our arms just like this. That's what it's talking about. They fold their hands. They fold their arms just like this. It says that they're unsuccessful. What, what that means is they go to a learning environment. Okay, let's just uh, let's say you're in a workplace and you're a salesperson, and you go to learn how to be a salesperson, and you just sit in the back of the room like this. You don't even have to be in the back of the room. You're just sitting there like this, and you're hearing it. Yeah, that's yeah. I'm sure if I did that, it'd make my life better, and that's cool. But you never do anything about it. You never take that knowledge and apply it to your life to help you be more successful. Some of you are giving the sign language even, and I know you just asked you to do it, and you're doing it really well. But some of you, even, I mean, some people, when they are in any kind of environment, whether they're in a worship service or whatever, they might be just sitting there going like this. Yeah, right. What time do I get out of here? What time am I getting out of here? That's their attitude. I know some of you may just be cold, and that's my assumption about all of you, because I know you are intrigued by everything I had to say when you come in here. I'm sure that's the way it is. But we need to learn to be successful. Let's look at the next one. Fools lean to the left. This is what I want to do. We're doing some more body language. We already clapped our mouth. We folded our arms. I want everybody to lean to the left. Do it right now. If you just leaned toward each other, something is very wrong. I think it's called dyslexia. I think that's the problem. I can say that because my wife suffers from that very thing. And um, we go the wrong direction. This is not a political statement. Ecclesiastes 10, the heart of the wise, the heart of the wise inclines to the right, but the heart of the fool to the left. Even as he walks along the road, the fool's lack sense and shows everyone how stupid he is. <laughs> okay, Man, I'm loving the word today. Not only can I call people fools, I can call people stupid. Isn't that good? Now, there have been times before that I've, I've used the word stupid and I've had parents come up to me and say, you know, damn, I, you know, I teach my kids not to call people stupid. I understand that. I realize that. Um, and, and really, we shouldn't teach our kids to call people stupid. But some of you are stupid. All right? I mean, really. <laughs> the Bible says this. Let me tell you, when you're stupid, you've got a left-leaning heart. You're not left-brained, you're left-hearted. A left-hearted person trusts in the wrong things with their heart, and when we trust in the wrong things with our heart, guess what type of decisions we make? Stupid decisions. There's one final thing. Fools don't remember what they've learned. The best way I know to put it is this. They keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over again. Some of you may be a fool today because you've learned something today about your life that you know you need to do something about, but you keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over again, sitting with arms folded 
and doing nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for words of wisdom from your word. And I pray, God, that as we hear it, it would change us. And I pray this in Christ's name. Heads bowed and eyes closed. God is good to be passionate enough to teach us what we need to know. What have you learned today about your life? Are you managing your life well? Maybe the family you're managing well. Maybe the maybe your your work or maybe your finances, but you're still longing. Maybe you haven't managed your spiritual life well. Or maybe you're not managing those other things well. And God wants to teach you and train you to help you manage your life better. Whatever it is, we're going to make a decision today to be wise or be a fool. I don't know which one you're going to choose. But of course, I would encourage you to choose to be wise, to hear Him and act upon what you hear. I would encourage you to pray wherever you are today. Some of you have not received discipline or correction well, and all you can do is criticize other people when they say anything critical to you. You're a fool. You're a fool because you're not learning things you need to learn. God wants you to be a better person. Wherever you are, I would encourage you to get honest with God and speak to Him truth. Make commitments to Him that will help you move forward in a better way.